Hello students, um, happy Friday. I wanted to go over with you today's um, right into the day, which is actually um, tied into the lesson for today. So this lesson today is about the basics on conducting research. And so I'm gonna kind of walk you through um, that today. This PowerPoint will be um, uploaded as well as my video lesson, and then it all ties in together with the right into today. And I'm gonna kind of go over that with you. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So we're talking about conducting research and I know you guys have probably all done some kind of research at some point in the process of your education. Um, but this is asking you to kind of think about it on a more scholarly level, a more college level thinking. And so let's kind of go over the first part, the basics. We're not going to really touch too much on MLA format today. Um, we're just going to, we're going to get all the components that we'll need for MLA citations. Um, and then you'll also, if you've done your red, no red ink, you'll have been doing some practice with that as well. All right, sorry about that. So let's, uh, let's resume. Okay, so essential questions. These are the things that kind of we want to touch on today. First of all, what does it mean to do research? We might have an understanding of what we think research is. Uh, what can be gained from conducting research? Why is it important? How can we conduct valid research? This isn't important. And then what are some good researching practices? So that's what this lesson is going to cover today. All right, so I have an audio file that I'd like for you to listen to. Um, this is from Paul Harvey. He was a radio personality known for a broadcast called The Rest of the Story. And as you start to listen to it, I want for you to kind of think about, can you predict the topic that the research is leading to? And then how does the researcher provide facts to tell us the rest of the story? So we'll take a listen. Mrs. Hopkinson was a civil servant, drawing a regular salary. Of course, he knew that, but still he had tackled and completed government projects above and beyond his duties as treasurer of loans and had accomplished them in his spare time. And it seemed to Francis that he ought to be compensated accordingly. He did not even ask for more money in his letter to superiors, but he said he would gladly accept a gift of some kind, perhaps a quarter cask of wine as a token of the government's gratitude. A quarter cask of wine? What kind of bureaucrat was this Francis Hopkinson? Or for that matter, what kind of a businessman? Well, the answer is, he was not much of either. Old Francis was certainly aimed in those directions. The son of a prominent lawyer, he was sent to the finest schools, encouraged to establish his own law practice, which he did, urged into politics, which led to minor offices in Delaware and New Jersey, and eventually a seat in the Second Continental Congress. What would Francis have preferred to do with his life? He'd rather have been an artist. All the while that he was half-heartedly lawyering and politicking, he was winning acclaim as a composer, a poet, an essayist, even a portraitist. Francis Hopkinson, you're saying to yourself? Oh, yes, yes, you've heard that name before. You've even seen his signature. For at the dawning of the American Revolution, he signed the Declaration of Independence. And then he went on to write pamphlets and poems promoting the colonists' cause. Well, that brings us to where you met him, working for the Treasury Board in 1780, unsuccessfully beseeching a little booze in exchange for his extracurricular achievement. Autumn of 1789, President Washington appointed Francis the first federal judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Thus honored, he would never again have to press for compensation or recognition in the matter of the aforementioned government projects. Matter of fact, in a little over a year and a half, he was dead. So if there is a moral to this story, maybe it's this, get paid, get paid. 
For if Francis Hopkinson, as treasurer of loans, had only been reimbursed for his artistry, for he had designed continental currency, he had designed the seal for our treasury board, he had designed the seal for the admiralty board, he had designed the great seal for the United States. If only he'd received a little bit of the money which he had designed for what he calls those labors of fancy. School children might be celebrating his creations to this day. But higher ups concluded that his government salary was sufficient remuneration, and so he was denied that which would have signified official recognition for his accomplishments, including this one the flag of the United States of America. That's right. Among Francis Hopkinson's labors of fancy was his design for the United States naval flag, which became our national flag, our stars and stripes forever. And yet because a Philadelphia seamstress named Betsy Ross did get paid 14 pounds and 12 shillings and tuppence for sewing the flag Hopkinson had created, it's she whom history reveres despite the rest of the story all right so that gives you um i think that they, they this is the kind of research that we want to do this is a kind of narrative research where we weave together what it is that we're researching into a story for our audience um i personally had never heard that story before um, I was really shocked and that's why I brought it to share with you because a lot of times when it comes to research, that is what we want to do. We want to surprise our audience with the things that we have discovered and learned. The rest of the story. So take a look and see these titles of these articles and kind of think, what do you see them as, um, as, as things that are in common? We've got, um, Obama's uh, Common Core, Frustrating and Failing Students, Parents and Teachers. We've got America, Who Are the Trenchcoat Mafia, Tennessee Friends, Vote No to Amendment 1, Don't them, Let Them Take Away Your Rights. So all of these titles kind of have um, an appeal, right? They serve as a hook. They serve as a thing that makes the reader want to get in, read the story so that they can then conduct their own research, right? When Because when we're reading about something that we don't know or something that we're trying to get in more information about, that actually is research. So good research is about asking the right questions. So it helps you to kick off your research, it narrows your focus, and then it takes it to a, a new le level. Um, so I want for you to read this article. It's the World School Lunches and Pictures. Um, and if this content of this article were our springboard, where would we go with research? So if I bring this up over here, um, teens are sharing gross pictures of their school lunches with the hashtag, hash, uh, thanks Michelle Obama. Um, and so, well, now I'm noticing that these, some of these pictures are not showing up for us. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, doesn't that look good? Okay, um, so take a look at some of these pictures that you're seeing. Can you relate? Have you seen these kinds of things inside of your lunch? Uh, what does it look like? This is the lunch right here. We've got some applesauce and a chicken sandwich. Um, so if we were going to see, if you're just looking at the pictures, if that's all we were focusing on, um, and then we were reading the tweets, what kind of research story would we write? What would we write about? Would we write from the perspective of the teens? Would we write from the perspective of the cafeteria workers? Would we write from the perspective of this is the food that, that gets delivered to the school? These are the menus that get set up. Um, is cafeteria food, does it look disgusting, but it tastes good? There are tons of different things that we could um, springboard off of. And so I want for you to think about like, if you have a topic, um, then you, you might start out with, okay, well, why is this topic important? Or what are some things that people are talking about in regard to this topic? And then thinking about how can you expand that? Um, and as you go, you'll notice that your focus gets narrowed because you might have something really broad. Um, you know, for example, my topic, body image, right? That's a very broad topic. I need to narrow it in. 
Um, and really, you know, as I've been conducting my preliminary research, I think that my question is moreover, what is the importance of body image? Why is that significant to me? Um, so let's talk about the benefits of research. One is it awakens you to new ideas. It encourages you to look beyond the surface because questioning leads to critical thinking. So I want for you to kind of approach this process with a questioning frame of mind. Why does this matter? Why is it important? Why do people think the way that they do? It gives you, um, it opens you to other viewpoints. Uh, it allows you to exercise your right to fact check. It, it gives you confidence because you have evidence that you can support your claims with. And then to get the rest of the story. So very rarely is something just off the surface, like with the school lunches, there's so many nuances. School lunches this year are different. I mean, for those at home, you don't have to have school lunches, right? You get to make your own lunches, but this might spark some memories of other lunches that you've had um, and encourage you to think about well, why, are, why are school lunches the way that they are? Why has historically school lunches gotten a kind of a bad rap? Um, to think about those things, to get the rest of the story. There's a little brain snack. Uh, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but it's the illusion of knowledge. And what this means is thinking that you know you don't know till you know, and knowing requires getting, doing good research. So here's just some ideas for you to kind of think out, to brainstorm, what are the different types of research, what's the value of research, to kind of think um, about this as you are starting to conduct your own research. So when we do research, we've got primary and secondary sources. A primary source was written actual, the actual period of the event. So if it's a historical document, then that's something that's written, like if it's about the Civil War that was written during the Civil War. But a primary source could also be letters, journals, diaries, newspapers, tweets, uh, social media posts. Those are all primary sources. Um, the difference is that these give you firsthand accounts or the viewpoint of someone who is there, was there to experience that event. Um, and so if you're not really sure, just pretend to ask the writer, were you actually there? Because if somebody wasn't there, for example, like we could write about living in coronavirus and the time of coronavirus, right? Or distance learners, you could write about this perspective of being a distance learner. But you can't write about the person, if you're a distance learner, you cannot write about the perspective of being an on-campus learner and the differences there, right? Like we can only hypothesize. We have to rely on primary sources, asking people who are on the street, um, people who are in the classrooms, people who are at home to give us those different perspectives. A, second a secondary source is something that is written either later or written as a product of. So it's after an author has done some research. So let's say somebody's writing about the wildfires that are happening right now concurrently in life, right? But they already are happening, so we have to conduct research. So therefore, anything that if you're not writing about living through the, the wildfires, if you're reporting on them and telling us information about them, then that is a secondary source. So we might use things like uh, encyclopedias, Wikipedia, textbooks, newspaper articles, that kind of thing. Um, if you're not sure, just ask yourself, when did the event happen and, what, and when was this actually published? So when we're evaluating sources, we want to make sure that we have credibility. And so you can use the acronym CARS. Credibility is to check the author and purpose. Is it accurate? Uh, check the date, grammar, spelling, typos. I noticed my own typo there. Is it reasonable? Check the tone and check the bias. And then support, check the sponsor. Um, so credible sources are ones that you can trust. We can trust that the author's ideas are his or her own and can be backed up with evidence. Um, we always want to use credible sources, okay? Um, now, a person who, if you're writing about, let's say, depression, a person who writes about the experience of living with depression is a credible source because they have depression, right? Um, a credible source could also be like a parent of someone who is, uh, you know, that you interview, that you talk to about what's it like living, you know, being a parent to a child that has depression, okay? So those are, those are both credible, valuable, valuable sources. Um, 
When you're looking at a source on the internet, you should check things to make sure that the information is credible. That, in, that includes authority, accuracy, objectivity, currency, and coverage. And we're going to talk about those. Um, this link here will kind of go over with you how to know if something is uh, credible. Um, I think that this is a great resource. I, I've pulled from it because I think that there's some really fantastic um, things that also asking questions like, can I find credible sources at the Bethel Library? Yes, you can. Um, our social media posts, blogs, and videos like on YouTube, um, Vimeo, and et cetera, credible sources, maybe. Uh, what about Wikipedia? Uh, Wikipedia is a gray area source because it's open source. That means anybody can edit it and, and change the content. So we encourage you to be very, um, to use Wikipedia as a springboard, as a place to like familiarize yourself with the topic, but not as a source that you're actually going to, to cite. Um, however, you will notice with Wikipedia that you can use it uh, to find credible sources. And so I'm gonna show you um, kind of a hack on that right now. Um, so if I go to Wikipedia, I think they're going to ask me for donations because it seems like it's donation time. Um, okay, so let's take a look at just the, the article on community, the TV show. Okay, um, so if you scroll down to the very bottom, you will notice and this, you know, you could read through here and get a really great overview of what the show is, the characters that are in it, the awards that it's gotten, the critical reception, et cetera, to give yourself some background. Um, but then you'll notice at the very bottom, you've got references. Your references that are at the bottom of your Wikipedia, those are your credible sources. Those are the sources that you can use, okay? Um, so if you want to know more about like when community was re renewed, you can click on a link here and then evaluate, is that a credible source, okay? Um, so Wikipedia does has, have resources that you can use um, that can be very helpful. So here are some things about figuring out if something's, um, if we can trust it. So first of all, authority. Is there an author? So is the author's name listed? What is that author's name? Um, what are the author's credentials? Do these help to identify the author as an authority in the field? So if you are doing an article, uh, if you're doing some research background information, again, I'm just going to use the example of depression. We would probably want to have a definition, understanding of depression that comes from maybe a board certified uh, psychiatrist, right? Um, maybe that comes from a doctor that can kind of give us that authority. Um, my definition of depression as a, as a teacher is not going to be as authoritative as a doctor, right? Um, if they have any institutional affiliations, are those, are those sourced? Are they listed? Sorry to crap back there. Um, is there a relationship between the institution and the doctor clear? So it, or uh, author clear. So like if you're looking at a doctor, you might want to see where that doctor works, where they got their, their license, etc. Uh, does the author address, uh, list a way to get in contact with them? Uh, that also helps with authority. And then is there a link somehow to find out who this person is? Accuracy. Is it reliable? Is it free from errors? If you notice a bunch of typos, that's not accurate, okay? Um, is it clear who's responsible for the accuracy of the material? Like who um, who sponsors this, okay? Um, are there links to other reliable sources? If they have statistical material, are there sources for that? Or did somebody just make up some numbers? And I know that that seems very um, skeptical, but people make up facts all the time and they just throw them out there. And what happens is, is that people accept that as fact, or they manipulate statistics in order to create uh, different biases and so that's really important, especially in this uh, coronavirus world. Um, what if any questions were not answered? Um, were you able to find the answers elsewhere or did you have to look outside of that? 
coverage is the scope of the topic clearly stated and so what's the scope of the page so like if we are going to be doing some research on something like anorexia we might start at a place like webmd that's an authoritative source it's it's sourced by doctors um, it would give us probably a really good scope of the topic right um, there might be some supporting materials um, do they help and make the author's point, which generally speaking for definitions should probably just be um, information, right? It shouldn't be trying to persuade you to think any other way. Are there links to other resources? And then where do they take you? What do they do? Um, and then is the site still under construction? Because if it's still under construction, then that's not, that kind of reduces the authority of, of the author. Currency, what's the date of the latest revision? So if you're not sure, you can scroll down to the very bottom of the web page to see um, if you're looking in a book, you would look at that, um, that table of, con right before the table of context on the index, is the date given for when the information was gathered. So if you are doing a story on coronavirus, um, if you're doing a, something about coronavirus, then you probably wouldn't want to trust information that came out like in March because at this point that information is old information. You would want something within the past couple of months. Um, is the page that you found it on kept current? Like has it not been updated since 2007? Because if it hasn't been updated since 2007, that's not a good source. Are the links current? Like if you click on them, do they take you someplace that really works? And then again, asking yourself, is this the latest information? Um, see if there's anything new that's been learned. Let's talk about objectivity. So when we're looking for credible sources, we're looking for the least possible bias. Now the exception here is for a primary source. A primary source may have bias because it's a lived experience, okay? Um, but my example here is if you're looking at a history site um, and you're maybe you're doing something about like the effects of the American Revolution um, or maybe you're doing something about like how Hamilton is not completely historically accurate. Okay, and that you think that's a problem because people are in love with Hamilton and that it's creating a, a misguided view of history. Okay, so if it would depend on the sites that you were looking at, like if they were look, if they were things that were in direct competition, for example, with the Disney Network, um, or if it was written by uh, you know somebody who is just like Jane, Jane fan on the street versus a historian. Historian. Um, are there facts or is it persuasive? Things can be factual and persuasive at the same time, but it's important for you to be aware of the objectivity of your author. Um, and then are graphics or images used to sway you and in what way? Um, because you want to just acknowledge that in the process. So for today's right into the day, we have a practice research that will help prepare you for next week's blog post on the background of your issue. So I want for you to open your right into the day and view the list of possible research topics about Tennessee myths, ghosts, and legends. And I'm gonna share that with you. Okay, so sources that you may use, you can use any of the other sources. And then I have a whole bunch of different topics here that you can explore to conduct some research. After that, I'm asking you to copy a link and you're gonna have these research source cards. I'll give you an example that kind of shows you um, the topic, all right? So if you're gonna put in history of lover's leap, okay? And then for this exercise, you can use websites for everything, okay? Um, so I want for you to think, what is some evidence from the source that you would pull to give information to your readers about whatever that historical document is, okay? Um, and then citation. So the citation, I want to see the article title. I want to know where did it come from, any kind of database. And so you can copy this and put this into your citation information um, so that you've got it down here and then it's easy for you to just copy and edit as you go, okay? So this is to kind of practice. And again, it's not having all of the elements that you would have for your work cited, 
Um, but it is all of the elements that you will need if you're when we're working with MLA format next week. So I want for you to practice, I want you to practice and complete four task cards for the topic that you're researching today. And that topic that you're researching today is the um, is about Tennessee history. And then I want you to apply the same model to kind of start doing some preliminary background research on the blog post that we will be posting next Tuesday. So what I want for you to set this up as for, for especially for people that are at home that are that are watching, is that I want for you to um, carve out some time on, on Tuesday to watch my lesson that I go over with you and then to use some research time. And then if you have questions to jump on a Zoom for me at the end of the class period so that you can ask any questions that you have. Um, all right, so if you have questions for what we're doing today, shoot me an email, I'm here to help. Um, and I will be posting this on our, um, our Google Classroom shortly. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.